Uh, good day to the uh, students in North Dakota history. Uh, this uh, lecture with this PowerPoint uh, goes along with the notes that I posted on the Nonpartisan League, and it covers the beginning of the League and then a little bit about uh, William Langer, who was one of the most uh, influential people associated with the League. In the lecture notes that I posted, I noted that the progressive movement really never caught on so much in North Dakota, but North Dakota had its kind of homegrown reform movement that actually in many ways was more radical than the progressive movement. Uh, the Nonpartisan League was founded by farmers who believed that the state legislature was not paying enough attention to their needs. And they, uh, they pushed for reforms that would help the farmers. One of the major leaders in founding the Nonpartisan League was A.C. Townley. Townley had uh, gone into flax farming in a major way in 1907. He leased 7,000 acres of land in the Golden Valley region out on the border of North Dakota and Montana. But Flaxseed uh, experienced a steep decline in the prices it was getting, and uh, by 1912, he had gone bankrupt. He had also become involved in socialist politics and was a leader in the regional socialist movement. Townley knew, however, that the word socialist was not uh, popular with people, but he did know that some of the ideas that the, po the socialists promoted would be popular with people. And that was his idea, to get away from the name. Uh, in February 1913, he met with some friends, Albert Bowen and Fred Wood, at a farm owned by Fred Wood in uh, McHenry County, North Dakota. And they organized the Farmers Nonpartisan Political League. The League uh, hired recruiters to go out and try to recruit farmers, and they drove around the state in um, Model T Fords. Uh, in less than 12 months, they had covered about three-fourths of the state and signed up 30,000 members. By 1916, their membership would be 40,000. In 1916, every candidate that they backed was elected. Now, most of these candidates were in the Republican Party, and until after World War II, the Republican Party, uh, the, the MPL was basically a, a kind of subgroup within the Republican Party. Um, In 1916, the um, Nonpartisan League pit, picked uh, Lynn Fraser as their candidate for governor and uh, William Langer as their candidate for attorney general. They were both elected. Uh, in the State House of Representatives, the Nonpartisan League controlled 81 of the 113 seats. In the Senate, they controlled 18 of 44 seats. <clears throat> This slide is a picture of the cover of the nonpartisan leader uh, newspaper that they published or magazine. Uh, this is from November 17, 1919, however. And uh, during World War I, the League had become, uh, they had tried to align more with the international socialist movement. And that was not popular with a lot of Americans who felt like it was uh, unpatriotic. Uh, Arthur C. Townley, in fact, was arrested during World War I for trying to uh, uh, interfere with the draft. This, called, this caused William Langer to decide to break with the League. He believed that this move toward uh, a more radical socialist position was going to hurt the League. Uh, in 1920, he did not run for re-election. His friend, uh, William Lemke, was elected that year. One of the ideas that the Nonpartisan League pushed strongly was that the state should own a bank and a grain milling company. 
the idea behind these state-owned businesses is that they would not aim at making a profit. They would work to benefit the people of the state. So the bank would offer low interest loans to citizens of North Dakota, and the mill would pay fair prices uh, for crops when the farmers sold them. Both of these were created. They still operate. This, the uh, North Dakota mill is at Grand Forks, and the Bank of North Dakota is headquartered in Bismarck. Because North Dakota is the only state to have these kind of state-owned businesses, some jokingly call North Dakota the most socialist state in the nation. Uh, after these businesses were created in the 1919 legislature, legislative session, uh, the Grand Forks Herald editorialized that the state is now the socialistic laboratory of the country. In 1916, Lynn Fraser had been elected governor with nonpartisan league support, and he was a, a fairly reform-minded governor. Uh, virtually every candidate, as I said earlier, that the nonpartisan league backed won in 1916. And so here's their uh, uh, newspaper from that right after the election, the clean sweep in North Dakota. Ironically, the, the Nonpartisan League backed direct democracy issues such as a recall, and Fraser was eventually removed from office by a recall movement. The Independent Voters Association grew up in the late teens as a group to challenge the Nonpartisan League's power in North Dakota. They launched a recall movement against Fraser the Attorney General William Lemke and John Hagan. They all were removed from office. And Fraser was the first governor in U.S. history to be removed by the process of recall. Now, as I said earlier, William Langer was involved in the early days of the League and was elected Attorney General uh, under the League. But later he breaks with the League. He believed that they, they were moving too far to the left. Ironically, in the 1930s, he returns to the League at a time when it had kind of suffered uh, from uh, its move toward socialism, and he was a major figure in helping it to recover. This slide shows you the red flame that is burning the heart out of North Dakota. This was... Uh, uh, a poster by people who were opposed to the League, and uh, the red flame, of course, associates it with socialism. Now, Langer was elected uh, governor in 1932 after he came back to gain support of the League. Uh, that year, of course, that was uh, the year FDR was elected, and of the 43 governors elected that year, Langer was the only Republican. But he was a nonpartisan league Republican. So conservative Republicans in the state and Democratic newspapers and uh, Democratic leaders attacked him uh, relentlessly. Langer began, began his own paper in 1933 called The Leader. And he expected that state employees who had got their position because of his patronage or his support of them uh, would contribute financially to support this paper. Now, some of these state employees were actually paid with money from New Deal federal programs. And so the FDR administration went after Langer. Uh, this was somewhat hypocritical because everyone in the United States knew in those years that if you were a U.S. postmaster, you were expected to contribute some of your salary back to the Democratic Party. <clears throat> now, Langer was tried for embezzlement, embezzlement of federal funds and was convicted, but many people in North Dakota saw him as a martyr who was a victim of a witch hunt uh, by the Roosevelt administration. 
Actually, on the day his conviction was handed down, he overwhelmingly won the Republican nomination for uh, re-election, the, the Republican primary uh, for re-election. But uh, the next day, the North Dakota Supreme Court ruled that as a convicted felon, he would have to step down from the governor's position. Lieutenant Governor Ole Olson completed the remainder of uh, Langer's term. In 1934, Langer man maneuvered to try to get his wife, uh, Lydia Langer, nominated for governor by the Republican Party. She was nominated, but some old-time nonpartisan league leaders turned against Langer and supported the Democratic candidate, Thomas Moody. Thomas Moody uh, was from Minnesota and had bought a newspaper business in Williston, North Dakota. He was elected, but shortly after the election, supporters of Langer found out that uh, Moody had voted in an election in Minnesota at a time when, uh, in order to be eligible to run for governor, he should have been a citizen of North Dakota. If he voted in Minnesota, that meant he was claiming citizenship there. So he was forced to step down. His lieutenant governor, Walter Welford, then served the remainder of his term. So in a few months, uh, North Dakota had four governors, Langer, Olson, Moody, and Welford. Uh, this is a uh, picture of a, an article by Langer uh, during the Depression years. We'll talk more about uh, Langer as governor and as senator during the Depression uh, in a later lecture. This is a picture of him with his wife, Lydia, uh, voting. Ole Olson, uh, who uh, assumed the governorship, he was the lieutenant governor when Langer was forced to step down. Thomas Moody, who served as governor of North Dakota for all five weeks. Now, in May of 1935, Langer's federal conviction was overturned. Uh, the FDR administration tried him on two or three other charges, but he never was convicted. And of course, this just contributed to the feeling in North Dakota that he was a, a martyr that the FDR administration was out to get. In 1936, he ran for governor and was elected. He did not win the Republican Party primary, so he ran as an independent. That meant there, that meant there was a three-man race, and he won the election as governor with only 36% of the vote. He was again elected as an independent in 1930, uh, I think it should be 1938 on the slide, uh, becoming the only man in U.S. history to be elected governor twice as an independent candidate. Now, Langer was elected as a U.S. Senator in 1940, but a group of North Dakota voters sent a petition to the Senate asking them not to seat him because of charges of corruption against him. The Senate investigated for over a year, and it was not until March of 1942 that he was seated. Langer went on to serve 20 years in the Senate. His voting record was a kind of progressive republicanism, somewhat similar to what uh, Theodore Roosevelt had stood for, perhaps. But he opposed many New Deal programs, and he was firmly isolationist in international politics. After World War II, he was one of only two senators who voted against the U.S. entry into the United Nations. It's interesting to think about the nonpartisan league. Um, a few years ago, we had a speaker here. Um, <clears throat> well, I wish I could remember his name, a very important uh, consumer advocate, Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader back in the 60s had written a book called Unsafe at Any Speed about the, uh, the safety record of General Motors Corvair. And he became from that time on, uh, he is still alive and he's still uh, active in uh, consumer affairs and uh, attacks on uh, corruption in big business and government. But he came here to speak and uh, I was very impressed with him. I probably wouldn't agree with him much on some political issues, but you had to uh, 
admit he was a true believer. He um, he stayed a long time after his speech was over talking with the students. And he introduced his message by talking about how North Dakota should be proud of this kind of uh, radical reform movement that grew up in this region. Now, the Nonpartisan League was not only uh, in North Dakota, but North Dakota was one of the centers of the power of this movement. We'll talk more about uh, the Depression in the next uh, set of lecture notes and about um, Langer's record as governor and then as senator. So this is the end for today. Uh, good night and good luck.